to another fresh half hour of ESPN News. Steve Bunin, Mike Yam with you. We started off with a little baseball, but significant news in the NFL. Some news about the Giants coming up shortly, but we start things off with arguably the best quarterback in the league. Well, that is the great argument that we've had the last couple of years, whether it's Tom Brady, Drew Brees, but no matter what, Peyton Manning is in the conversation. And now he's rich. Okay, he was already, he was rich. already rich. But now he is tied with Tom Brady for the richest average annual contract in the National Football League. Five years, 90 million. That's 18 million per, which is the exact same as Tom Brady's deal with the Patriots. And that is no coincidence. Here is what team owner Jim Ursay tweeted about the deal. It's a credit to Peyton. He put Colts fans, teammates, Indy, and winning ahead of all else. It's 69 million for the first three years. That's 23 per. 90, so that's 11 million per in the last two. So it's cap friendly. Right, good information there from Jim Ursay himself. Chris Mortensen joining us now on ESPN News. Mort, why did Tom Brady have such an impact on these negotiations? Who's happiest about that? Pirates fans, because it dropped St. Louis into a tie with Pittsburgh for first place in the NL Central. No sports anchor has uttered that sentence this late in a season since 1997, so it's worth stating again. It's July 16th, and the Pittsburgh Pirates are tied for first place in their division. This is a franchise working on a North American major sports record, 18 straight losing seasons. 18 in a row! The Bucks had to win last night to do it. Jeff Carson sort of typified their season very quietly. 83 pitch shutout of the hapless Astros, said skipper Clint Hurdle. One of the best pitch games I've seen, and he's been in baseball 35 years. Andrew McCutcheon triples, knocks in a pair of runs, and Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh! Finds itself atop the National You're League trying to convince Central. yourself a little bit. I mean, look at it. Download this screen, put it onto a DVD, and throw it on eBay. See what you get for it. The Pirates in first place for the first time since 1997, July 17th, when they were 47 and 47. The Buccos finished that season 79 and 83. They're well said. We've got our second highlight in at the Bronx. Yankees down 4-2. Bottom of the ninth, nobody out. Derek Jeter, three for four. He and Brett Gardner are both on. They both pull off the Runners double steal. Safe. Gardner would score. Jeter is then later on third, <clears throat> excuse me, after a sacrifice fly. Robinson Cano is up, two for four on the day. Calls for time, doesn't get it. And then a weak grounder to end the game. How about that? Andrew Bailey with his 11th save of the season. That puts him among the team leaders. And the Oakland A's beat the Yankees 4-3. to three. Athletics' top four hitters go 7 for 18 with two homers. The team snaps an 11-game skid to the Yankees as A.J. Burnett loses once again. He is now winless in his last four starts. The Yankees won this game 17-7 last night. They lose 4-3 to three today. Much more from Major League Baseball with a brand-new crew coming up. Rodgers in the house on ESPN News. Mariners and Red Sox, it is over. It started well for Seattle, trying to stop a 14-game losing skid off Tim Wakefield. Miguel Olivo, a two-run blast. The problem for the Mariners was they continued to play the game. In the bottom of the first, the Red Sox batted around. Kevin Euclid had the big blast, a two-run shot. Mazel tov to him. That was pretty much it for the Mariners. Boston, five runs in the inning. They scored five in the fifth inning as well. Carl Crawford with the bases loaded. Boston scoring seven earned runs off of Michael Pineda, whose slide continues. His ERA, the first 15 starts of the season, 2.45. Last five starts, 7.71. He has hit the rookie wall. As for Tim Wakefield, another Wakefield-like performance. Not that great, but good enough in a game like this. Four strikeouts gets him to 2,000 for his Boston career. Second on the team's all-time list. Some pretty interesting names on that list. So what happens is the tree gets to the sawmill. And it's hand cut with a chainsaw. And then what? Then more and more wood is carved into really thin slices with a super sharp blade. Like a like a razor sharp? Like really, really sharp. Got to be messy. Oh yeah, there's wood everywhere. How long does something like that take? Hours. They just keep cutting, cutting, cutting. I get your name in the bat. That's all laser. <laughs>
You know Bernie Williams as the four-time World Series champion among the Yankees' all-time leaders in almost every offensive category. He is also the Latin Grammy-nominated guitarist whose new book is out. It is called Rhythms of the Game, The Link Between Musical and Athletic Performance. Bernie, what was harder to master for you, baseball or guitar? Well, I think there, I still consider both a work in progress. <laughs> Even though I left the game, you know, I, I never really thought that I, you know, completely mastered it. And uh, music, definitely a work in progress. But I think that's the attitude that you need to have, you know, in order to keep be getting better, you know, at your craft. You know, day in and day out, you always have to feel like you still need to learn something. And you originally signed with Paul McCartney's label, and Paul Simon wrote the introduction to this book. Which one would make you more nervous to play with on stage? Oh, uh, both of them. You know, no <laughs> doubt about it. I mean, you take Paul, uh, Paul Simon and, and Paul McCartney, some of the best uh, singer songwriters of, of this, you know, generation, uh, you know, in the history of, you know, of music. So it's, uh, uh, I mean, it's just very overwhelming to think about that. <laughs> you have had opportunity to play with some great guitarists and songwriters over the years and singers. How did playing center field in New York? with the Yankees prepare you for playing music with those kind of legends? I think it was very instrumental, you know, the, the fact that I was uh, able to, you know, be exposed to very high intensity, high pressure situations, you know, facing, you know, you know, guys with the game on the line, you know, bases loaded, you know, and you have to really perform in that point in time. Uh, you learn how to block everything out and, and concentrate on the moment and focus on, on being, you know, having a good performance. And it's, you know, no different in, in music, you know. Uh, you know, obviously it comes down to preparation. You have to have a plan, you know, you have to do your, you know, due diligence and, and play and, and, you know, practice. But then you just gotta, you know, let it go and, and, you know, let it rip and see what happens. And you are part of a team with a band, part of a team with you guys in the Yankees. He's, of course, Derek Jeter. He had that magical 3,000 hit day. What was that like for you watching that happen to your friend? I was just so proud of him. You know, he, he was just, you know, he'd been one of my uh, closest friends on the team. Uh, and uh, just to watch him, you know, perform like that at that caliber, you know, uh, he didn't really limp into the uh, milestone. He just busted the door right open, you know, with the home run. Uh, a home, for him, a home run? I mean, come on, you didn't expect that. I, well, I don't think anybody did, you know. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's, it, it, obviously going five for five as well, you know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I know that he has been, you know, uh, struggling a little bit during the season with health, you know, issues and stuff like that. So just to come out and have him perform like that, I was just very happy for him. That leads me to my next question about the All-Star game, because he got in hot water for skipping the All-Star game. You made it five times. What would have had to happen to you to miss an All-Star game? Well, what actually did happen to me one year, I was hurt and I was, you know, um, uh, strongly suggested by the team <laughs> that, you know, just to, you know, be because of my health issues, not to participate in the game, and uh, it, which I think that's what he's doing. I think, you know, he's t putting the team first. He's looking at the second half of the season uh, and uh, perhaps an opportunity to play in the postseason. Mm -hmm. And uh, if he does that and leads the team, you know, the way he's supposed to, nobody's going to really pay too much attention about the All-Star game. Of the guys they call the core four, of course, Jeter, Rivera, Posada, and Pettit, which was the most musically inclined of those four? Uh, none of them. <laughs> <laughs> that was my next question. Which was the least? <laughs> no, well, no, actually, you know, they were all, you know, you know I, I think... Um, Obviously, Jorge, you know, with his Latin heritage, he liked the salsa and the Spanish rock. Derek was more of an R&B guy, I think. You know, I think Petty was more of, you know, contemporary Christian country music. And Mariano, you know, from Panama, you know, Ruben Blades, you know, a lot of the Latin music as well. <laughs> they make requests so, for you? You're like a, a jukebox well, walking around. Yeah, I mean, I try to, you know, sometimes, you know, when, on, a, on a good day, you know, I would try to, you know, play a little music for them. You know, but on a bad day, you know, <laughs> they have to get their rest. So. What about Paul O'Neill? He played drums, right? Yeah. How good very, is he or how bad is he? He's a very good drummer. Yeah? He's a very good. He can stay in the pocket. He, you know, he keeps <laughs> good rhythm. Uh, we actually have some great stories, you know, jamming on that, on that paint room at the old Yankee Stadium, you know, uh, you know way, way back. <laughs> Your debut came in 1991 in the major leagues, and Bud Selig became commissioner the following year. What do you think his legacy will be as baseball's commissioner? Uh, I think, you know, it's going to be a very important legacy. I, I think he took it upon himself to, to clean the game. I think he took a, a lot of steps towards, you know, making uh, a game a, a safer uh, you know, safer game, you know, with the, all the, you know, steroid scandal and, and all that stuff. I think, you know, he was, he really was very adamant and very assertive in trying to get, you know, make, make sure that uh, the players had a safe environment 
And uh, I think, you know, it, uh, to me, that's, that's going to be what I want to remember him for. And yet you played in this steroid era, and that is going to impact how people and how historians and fans in the future who never saw you play, how they view you. They're going to look at your stats, compare them to guys who used. How does that make you feel? Well, obviously, it's a very unfortunate and uh, unfair, you know, thing. It is what it is. And I think, you know, when people look at my career and the career of many of us that didn't do any of that, uh, any of those things, uh, they're going to hopefully look at the consistency. And uh, even though I did not hit too many, I try to hit them where they, when they <laughs> count it. So uh, look at the postseason, you know, record and, and things like that. And hopefully they'll, they'll make a, uh, you know, a more open-minded de decision and, and uh, you know, uh, asserting, you know, this guy's career on, on a different light. Do you think you belong in the Hall of Fame? That's not really for me to decide. You know, sure it I is. Do, I if do it was have, up to you. Oh, you I'll definitely go. <laughs> you know, but, but I think, you know, there's one thing that I, nobody can take away from me, which is the memories and all the th great things that I had playing, being a Yankee for 16 years, you know, being part of world championship teams and uh, winning a batting title, you know, gold gloves. You know, there's a lot of memories and a lot of uh, relationships that I developed over my career that uh, I, I'm going to take with me, you know, for, for, you know, forever. So it, it was just a great experience for me. And unlike many of your peers, you've now made the transition to a whole other line of work and equal uh, success in that as well. Bernie Williams, we appreciate your time on Outside Thank the Lines. So Thank you for joining us. We'll talk to uh, you soon. Absolutely. Do you think Bernie Williams is a Hall of Famer? What do you think of Ozzie Guillen's rants? Let us know on our Outside the Lines Facebook page. You can contact either Bob Lee or me on Twitter directly. We're back with more on Outside the Lines after this.